1996, we cloned a sheep. The clone, named Dolly, was grown from a single mammary cell, and she lived for seven years longer than most sheep. She was the first mammal to be cloned. That was almost 30 years ago. Do you really believe we've never tried on humans? I was that naive once. I started my freshman year at Brown in 2022, and I was looking for some laboratory experience to burnish my med school applications. Luckily, my dad had a connection. A college friend of his was a biology professor there, and he made an introduction. My first meeting with Professor Shockley, name changed of course, took place in his office, a windowless room in the basement of the sciences complex. The walls were gray cinder block, and manuscripts were stacked everywhere in towers and mountains that sometimes reached the ceiling. I'd arrived a bit early and I was examining the fish tank set beside one of the walls. The tank was illuminated by a single light, and rainbow fish schooled between fronds of seagrass, each fish no bigger than the nail on my pinky finger. Peter, I presume, came a voice behind me. I'd been so preoccupied that I nearly jumped out of my skin. It's okay, said the man who'd entered the room. He was tall and thin, with the kind of wiry muscling that only old men have, like they've been cured in the sun. He had lion cheeks and a mane of snowy hair, and he wore a crisp white lab coat. They're beautiful, aren't they? He asked, folding his arms behind his back and leaning in beside me to observe the fish tank. They are, I replied. They're neon tetras, right? Good eye, your dad didn't tell me you were an aquarist. I had a few tetras of my own when I was a kid. Ah, but these aren't just any tetras. Can you tell me what's special about these specimens? I leaned in closer. The fish were beautiful, but they didn't look any different than the ones I'd owned. I shook my head. I'm really sorry, but I can't tell the difference. He smiled broadly. There was something in his smile that seed a bit off. How wide his lips went, the way they curled over his teeth. That's the special part, he told me, settling in behind his desk and gesturing for me to sit opposite. They're just like any other tetras. But these are clones. I instantly felt excited. My dad hadn't given me many details on Shockley's work, but I was sure that cloning would look irresistible to med school admissions committees. I spent the rest of the meeting nodding enthusiastically at whatever Shockley said, and 15 minutes later, we shook hands when he offered me a research associate position in his lab. I spent the next month getting up to speed. Most research labs at Brown had around a dozen members, but Shockley's was an exception. The only other member was a PhD student named Elizabeth, a mousy and dark-haired girl of Eastern European origin. She mostly kept to herself, barricaded in the room down the narrow hallway that housed the growing tanks and reagents. I busied myself in Shockley's office reading hundreds of protocols and journal articles, some of which I needed to translate from Russian, Chinese, and Korean. All the while I wondered what was behind the heavy steel door that led to the lab. As I read more about protocols for cell growth and culture mediums, my transactional interest gave way to genuine curiosity. The loud thunk of the lock turning became an irresistible siren song. Shockley himself was even more of an enigma. I only saw him a few times during my month of reading, but it seemed like he never left the lab working day and night even after Elizabeth left each day around 11. What are you two doing back there? I asked her finally, once I'd worked up the courage. The professor will tell you when he thinks you are ready. That took another month, during which I spent nearly every night reading in Shockley's office, while the school of clone Tetris swirled in their tank behind me. I was walking out around midnight one day when Shockley spotted me in the hallway. Peter, you're not leaving, are you? Yeah, is that okay? I have an econ midterm tomorrow morning. A look almost like anger washed over his face, but it was gone in an instant. Econ, huh? Is that something that interests you? I shrugged. I figure it's a good thing to learn. You know, to get more well-rounded and all. He shook his head. Our best and brightest come to our greatest universities and get so preoccupied with hedging their bets. In evolution, it's the specialists who survive. The 
ones who go all in on something. Remember that, Peter. I wasn't really sure what he was getting going at, but it was clear I'd touched some nerve. Of course, Professor. He glanced behind him. Listen, before you go, would you like to see the lab? Any tiredness I'd been feeling evaporated. It was like an electric current had run through me. Yes, I replied instantly. Come, he said, whipping around. I rushed to follow him. A paper sign was affixed to the door to the lab. Do not enter. Shockley reached into his pocket and fished out a key ring. One of the keys was big and brass, the second silver, the third small and iron, with a pair of wings on the top. The brass key opened the door, and he held it open. After you. The lab was much bigger than I'd anticipated. As Shockley led me through the various bench tops and sterile hoods, showing off the huge closets full of glassware and reagents, I got the impression that this lab was better suited to a group of 30 scientists or more, and certainly too large for just Shockley and Elizabeth. You have more fish back here, I observed, pointing to a glass tank that was almost as tall as I was. Five thousand tetras, give or take, Shockley said, plus drosophila and mice. And they're all? He smiled. Clones, of course. There was a small cage nestled between two sterile hoods in the back of the room. What lives in there? I asked. That's Betty's crate, Shockley replied. Betty? She's around here somewhere. I know it's verboten in the lab, but I like to let her roam free. Something bumped against the back of my calf, and I looked down to see a beagle sniffing my leg. The dog's fur was mottled with gray patches, and one of her eyes was cloudy. I bent down to scratch her behind the ears. I do have one rule, though, Shockley told me, suddenly serious. No gum. I felt my cheeks redden. Of course, I'm sorry. It's perfectly fine, he said. There's a trash can in the corner over there. The next day, after my midterm, Shockley called me into his office and asked me if I was ready for my first project. You'll be cloning Tetris, he told me, after I enthusiastically agreed. I assume you're familiar with the protocol? I had read dozens of papers on this very subject, and I told him so. That's good, he said. Can you start tonight? Thankfully, cloning fish wasn't too difficult, just time-consuming. I regularly stayed in the lab past midnight, spending nearly a month preparing donor cells and collecting eggs ejected from female tetras. The micro-manipulation, the transfer of the cultured donor cell nuclei to the donated eggs, was the trickiest part but Elizabeth helped me out after two failed solo attempts. By Christmas break, I had a dozen cloned eggs. I spent two days on pins and needles, hardly leaving the otherwise empty tank reserved for my experiment. When the first fry emerged from their shells thin as eyelashes, I nearly cried with relief. I let my fish grow when I went home for the break. Two weeks later, they'd grown nearly to full size. I scooped some into a cup and carefully walked down the hallway to show Shockley. He held the cup up, examining the fish up close. These are spectacular, he said. Then, to my surprise, he dumped the cup of fish into the tank in his office. It was the greatest compliment he could have paid me. I think you're ready for the next step, he said. Mammalian cloning. My heart began to hammer hard in my chest. Amazing, I said, hardly believing my luck. The mice? He shook his head. Not mice and not the normal surrogate protocol either. It's time I show you my greatest achievement. I thought that he would lead me back into the lab. Instead, he led me up the dimly lit staircase that opened directly onto the sidewalk. Night had fallen, and slush piles took on an eerie glow beneath the greenish moonlight. My shoes squelched as I followed him to a nearby alley where he'd parked his car. Going off campus? I asked him. It wasn't uncommon for labs to be distributed across the main campus, atop College Hill, and the med school campus, which lay on the other side of the Providence River. That's right, he said with a twinkle in his eye. I didn't think much of it and I climbed into the passenger seat. Providence is a small town, and it was clear almost immediately that we weren't headed to the med school. Don't worry, Peter, said Shockley. It won't be far. His eyes remained on the road which weaved sinuously between old brick buildings. Something like worry perched in my stomach. But what for? 
Shockley might have been eccentric, but he wasn't a creep. Besides, wouldn't my dad have mentioned something? We drove past the football stadium, which stood almost two miles from campus. Shockley pulled to a stop outside a small two-story house. You live here? I asked. I do. I hope you don't mind. I keep a laboratory at home, you see. The university administration mostly leaves me alone, but if they knew about this, they'd shut me down. Or demand I publish my work. I'm not sure which is worse. He laughed at his own joke. A harsh barking sound. I laughed too. Despite making a mental list of everything that could go wrong, I followed him into the house. We passed through the bare foyer and the austere living room, out the sliding glass door that led to the backyard. There was a wooden shed there, and Shockley drew out his key ring. It was then that I saw the use of the second key, the silver one. Shockley turned the lock and led us inside. He shut the door behind us and moonlight seeped in through the gaps between the door slats. There was a hatch on the floor and Shockley pulled it open. It's a short way down, he said. I'll be right behind you. This was a step too far. Would you mind going first? I asked uncomfortably. He smiled, as though he knew what I'd been worrying over. Not at all, Peter. He stepped into the hatch and disappeared into the darkness. I heard only the hollow clang of his footsteps on the rungs of the ladder before the sounds too faded away. I followed after him. Luckily the ladder only descended twenty feet or so. My feet hit solid ground, smooth tile. I could hear Shockley breathing a few feet away. Where are we? I asked. My voice echoed, and I knew that we were in a tunnel. I built my shed over an old well that used to be on this property, he replied, moving down the tunnel. I followed after him, my hand tracing over the wall. A curious thing, it never seemed to fill, no matter how much it rained. One day, after a few too many whiskeys, I rappelled down to find a secret door at its base. That led to a tunnel, the same one in which we find ourselves now. Who built it? I asked. The abolitionists who built this house, I suppose. This place probably lay along the Underground Railroad. They didn't call it Providence Plantations for nothing. He had stopped. There was a low, bassy noise, like a huge cat awakening with a purr. Blinding white light flooded my eyes, which flashed with pain. Thankfully, it didn't take me long to adjust. I saw that we were in a small room, something that almost reminded me of a dungeon. The walls were old stone that glistened with moisture that seeped down from the low ceiling. There was a faint mildew scent, but it was overpowered by something much stronger, the unmistakable scent of blood. But I didn't linger on the smell long. My attention was firmly fixed on something else. In the center of the room stood a huge machine. It looked almost like a French press, a glass cylinder four feet across and nine feet tall. It was filled with a viscous red liquid. Pipes and tubes snaked from the top of its dome to the control panel on the wall, as well as to the series of metal containers on the floor. What is that? I asked. This, said Shockley, and there was unmistakable pride in his voice. This is the Gaia. It's the culmination of my life's work. I stepped closer to the machine. Without asking, I pressed my hand to the glass. It was warm, and I felt a subtle pulse from within, as though it had a heartbeat. This close, the smell of blood was even more potent, flooding my nostrils and nearly making me wretch. What does it do? I asked, my curiosity getting the better of my nausea. The onerous part of the cloning process is transplantation, Shockley explained. Finding a surrogate to carry the cloned embryo is inefficient. Animals do what we bid them. But what about creatures from whom we seek consent? I've solved that problem. Transplant a blastocyst to this chamber and it will grow. A gasp caught in my throat. From the day I met him, it was apparent that Shockley was a genius, but this, this was world-changing. Is he telling the truth? I wondered, searching his lined face. I didn't get the chance to inquire. Peter, I'd like for you to learn how to use it, said Shockley. 
Yes, I replied immediately. I won't go through all of the details here. It took Shockley nearly three hours to explain his protocol. All of the reagents he'd obtained, the order in which to add them, the precise temperatures and pH levels to be maintained. By the time we climbed back out of the shed, day had broken. Still, I was too excited to sleep. Shockley gave me a copy of his silver key. That night, I caught a cab to his house and ventured down again to start the project he'd given me. I didn't attend a single class that month. What was the point? Nothing I'd learn in econ could begin to approach Shockley's work in significance. I spent every free moment in Shockley's underground lab, culturing the cells that he'd obtained from his dog, Betty. Even more significant than Shockley's construction of the Gaia was the protocol he'd developed for genetically editing the embryos. A beagle's gestational period was around nine weeks. But inside Gaia, the modified embryos grew at double speed. Even though I only needed to check the growing embryos a few times a week, I spent hours in front of the Gaia, just watching the cells multiply. Brain, eyes, legs, tail. I had cultured three embryos. All three appeared viable. I could hardly believe my success. The long-awaited day arrived in the waning days of March, when Shockley came down to the lab and declared that the beagles had finished growing. He hit a button on the control panel, and with a groan, the liquid began to drain from the Gaia and into one of the circulatory tanks. It was gone in a few minutes. There was a pneumatically sealed hatch at the base of the cylinder and I pulled it open. The puppy shuffled inside. Oh my god, was the only thing I could say. I scooped each one into the soft pink towel that I'd prepared for this very occasion. All three of them were perfect, more precious than jewels. Well done, said Shockley, clapping me on the back. He smiled his wolfish smile and gestured for the bundle of puppies. Each one was no bigger than my hand, and he held each one gently as he examined the features. Excellent work. These are perfect specimens. I was about to thank him when Shockley snatched up the first puppy. He wrapped his fingers around its neck and gave a sharp tug. There was an awful, wet crack, and the body went limp. What the was all I could get out before he took the other two puppies from me, repeating the same gruesome procedure. The pink towel began to bleed. I could barely get out a single word. I stared at him venomously. Why? Why did you do that? I demanded, leaping forward and seizing him by the lapels of his white coat. He looked at me with pity. Take your hands off me, Peter, he said, eerily calm. I don't understand why you're so upset. Why, you just murdered three puppies like it was nothing. What's the matter with you? He laughed, and I felt my grip tighten. I'm not done teaching you, he said. You still cling to the notion that life is precious. But that's simply not true. Didn't we just create it from nothing? Life is no more valuable than money is. Money that we print from thin air. They were puppies. That elicited a louder laugh from him. As if that makes any matter. The universe is indifferent either way. There is no God, and if there is, he cares no more for the life of a puppy than he does for an oyster. And we just created life, my boy. So tell me, what does that make us? I had no retort. Shockley coiled his hands around my wrists. His skin was icy cold. Now, Peter, let me go. I don't know what it was about his voice, but there was a sudden menace in it. In an instant he seemed more gaunt than ever, the skin of his face almost transparent. It was like Shockley was no longer a man, but a skeleton. Fleshless. Bloodless. I couldn't help my stomach. I doubled over and vomited all over the floor. Shockley straightened his coat. You'll have to clean that up, he said casually. Come by the office tomorrow. We'll chat about your next project. He sauntered back down the hallway. Oh, he added, stopping briefly. His eyes were the only points of illumination, like torches in the darkness. Don't forget the specimens. I was too terrified to disobey. I thought about calling my dad, but what would I tell him that he'd believe? So I found my way to Shockley's office the next day. 
though not before stopping by the Army surplus store on Thayer Street for a can of mace and a tactical knife. Shockley had been poring over a draftsman's sketch on his desk. It looked to be the Gaia in replicate. At least twenty of the machines lined up side by side. At the top of the page was a detailed drawing of a pair of wings. Plans for the future? I wondered. He looked up when I entered, and he appeared amused to see me. Feeling better? He asked, stowing the sketch. I remained mute. You might get a kick out of this, he said. He took a photograph off his desk and showed it to me. It's me and your dad, back in our college days. Pretty neat, huh? Both men had aged. While my dad had lost his hair, Shockley had retained his, though not the fiery auburn coloring he possessed in his youth. I guess so, I told him coolly, handing the photo back to him. You mentioned another project. He nodded. Yes, this. He pulled open one of his desk drawers and revealed a scroll of paper, which he unfurled before him. Almost instantly, I knew what it was. You can't be serious, I told him. I would never joke about something like this. You don't have the stomach? I shook my head. Puppies, that was one thing. But to clone a human? How could you even think about something like that? He was silent for a moment. When he spoke, his voice was quiet. The lesson I taught you last night. A difficult one, I know. But it seems it sunk it. Else why would you be here? You're a smart boy, Peter. Surely you followed the argument to its natural extension. Life isn't precious. What about human life, I asked. His eyes widened, fixed me like spotlights. His voice seemed to drop an octave. Any life. Why not do this yourself? I asked when I regained my voice. Why bring me into it? He smiled wanly. The conclusion of my argument. What am I but an oyster? I felt my eyes narrow. Does that mean... His hand went to his belly. Stomach cancer. They caught it late as always. Nothing to do. How long? I asked, unsure whether or not I believed him. Six months, he told me. His voice was emotionless like he'd told me about a late package delivery instead. Maybe less. Now, do you see? You wanted someone to continue your work. He smiled. I told you you're a smart boy. And I wanted to teach someone young, too, someone with more years for experimentation. Have I explained myself enough? I nodded. One last question. Cloning humans. Is this your first time? His eyes twinkled with amusement. Why, of course. We made plans to reconvene in his shed the next day. I arrived just before midnight. Shockley stood before the Gaia, the machine pulsing malevolently. You're early, he told me. That's good. I've procured the cells we'll be culturing. Whose? He shrugged. Some undergrad. People are too careless with where they leave their DNA. Shall we begin? I nodded. My stomach was stretched tight. My heart pounded in my ears. Shockley turned away from me towards the control panel. And that was my moment. I lunged forward. The knife was already in my hand. The blade sunk in just beneath his right shoulder blade. Fabric, skin, flesh. None offered resistance. I removed the knife and stabbed him again. The kidney this time. Then the liver. He sank to his knees. I walked to face him. There were a million things I could have said. Some one-liner like a Hollywood star might give. But I had nothing. He opened his mouth as if to say something. But there was just a low exhale and a dribble of blood. His eyes were full of rage. And then... In an instant, they weren't. I spent the next hour destroying the Gaia, smashing it apart with a baseball bat I'd brought with me and hidden outside. The red liquid surged in a thunderous wave, carrying broken glass and mangled bits of metal. My shoes were soaked through. Shockley's arms began to float, ever so slightly. I didn't care if people found the lab. There was no way they'd figure out what the ruins of the Gaia were for. Hell, the police might have suspected Shockley of cooking meth. I poured a layer of gasoline over the floor, over Shockley's body. When I was all the way up the ladder, I dropped a lit match down. 
I felt the heat blast my face hotter than a furnace. I spent the next few weeks waiting for Shockley's death to become public. I was satisfied that I'd covered my tracks, but with each day that passed without any news, I began to worry. Maybe the police have found some evidence, I thought, terrified. Maybe they're building a case and that's why I haven't heard anything. I visited Shockley's lab on campus a few times. Of course he wasn't there. Neither was Elizabeth. Where had she gone? I thought the story ended there. But it didn't. Last week I saw a man getting out of his car a block from the sciences building. He was around 25 with auburn hair. He looked very familiar. It can't be, I thought. But I'd seen the old picture, hadn't I? The man caught my eye. And I was paralyzed. The same way a mouse freezes before a cat. A smile filled to his face. The gums curling over the teeth. Without saying a word, he pointed at me. With his other hand, he held up one finger, and then two. To start with, I just want to say... I wasn't a bad kid. I did some pretty shitty stuff, but I wasn't intentionally bad. Guess in the end, intentions don't matter much, though. The town I grew up in was small. We had a main street with shops like the post office, bakery, and butchers. And apart from a small block of concrete with a few pipes bolted down, the local skate park. And I use that term very loosely. That was about it. We were a mining town. So most of the men went to the quarry during the week, while the women stayed in town, teaching and nursing, running the bakery and stores alike. Our lives were set in stone, or at least they were meant to be. We would, like the generations before us, grow up and begin the same work our parents and grandparents did, having our own children and the cycle repeating. And maybe it would have, had things been different, according to my parents, or my mother at least. I was a wild child. Ever since I was little, I seemed to want to explore more. I was more headstrong, more questioning, than the other little girls she taught at nursery. She said it jokingly, half-heartedly, but I saw something else in her expression. Something that looked and felt like fear. My father never said much. Just stared over his glasses. His bushy eyebrows perched between a frown and a grimace whenever I spoke. I learned to avoid him when he was home only really seeing him at supper time. And while we ate, there was little time for words. Every night, Mum would do something to help others. She would sew and mend clothing for the children at her school, the poor families having little chance of buying new. And the second-hand clothing was always ripped and dirty. Dad smoked his pipe, sat on his recliner in the lounge, drowning out his family in the hum of the radio, where a man's voice played out telling stories and fables. I snuck out, feeling the cool night air against my skin, the goosebumps of danger with doing the wrong thing. I tried to convince my friends to join me, but no one else would. I loved my friends, I did. But they were similar to my parents in the way they didn't want to do anything much. They stayed in reading novels, or helping their mamas bake, sorting tools for their dads who did home improvement projects. Most families were the same in this town, I'd always had a suspicion, but once I began sneaking out of my house, I started sneaking into others. It was an accident the very first time. Honest. I saw a house, the curtains still open but there were no lights on inside. I stood outside and stared in, I could sort of make out the lounge suite, and see there were framed photos on the walls. For some reason, I just walked towards it, intrigued to be looking in at someone else's life I guess. I don't know. I tried the front door which was unlocked. I wasn't surprised. No one, including my family, bothered with locking the doors. We were a small and safe town. Our crime rate was basically non-existent. The door swung open and I closed it gently behind me, my heart pounding as I stood quietly at the threshold, just waiting to hear footsteps or voices at any moment. But nothing happened. I regained composure and stared to snoop around. I wasn't going to steal anything. I had no need. I just simply looked around, wondering about the family, about their lives. After a while of exploring the house, I left, making sure nothing was out of place. I closed the door softly behind me and walked home. They would never know anyone had been inside their house. I had found a new hobby. I was a weird kid, sure, 
but I never meant to harm anybody. I did it more and more, any empty place I could find. I had some close calls with cars pulling into the driveway while I was still upstairs in a bedroom, the front door opening before I'd had time to close the back door I'd escaped through. I was never caught though, I wish I had been. I wish to God someone had caught me. It's been a reoccurring fantasy for years, the dream I dream over and over, the one I wake up in a cold sweat from, tears burning my eyes, bile burning my stomach. But no one caught me in their house, no one stopped me. So I went to the house on Lefroy Street and what happened there changed my life forever. That night, it was cold. I was about to give up. I'd been out for an hour at least, and not come across one empty house. I felt tired, anxious. There was no reason for it, not one I could pinpoint. I made the choice to head home, get out of the dam, and so I began walking. I was near my street when I saw a familiar car speed off down the road. Mr. Chestermore, he was a teacher at my school, and apparently, so the gossiping girls at school claimed, he had some terrible accident years before, which meant he wasn't fit for work in the mines. So that's why he was one of the rare males who held a job in the city. He taught science and he was pretty nice, always taking the time to listen to us and explain things in a kind way. He walked with a hobble and a special cane, which made the gossip's rumors seem to be more than maybe just Chinese whispers, but no one really knew for sure. The rumors ranged from the accident being shooting himself in the leg while hunting, to being stabbed by a group of ninjas. I know, I know, looking back that just sounds ridiculous, but you gotta remember, we were just kids back then. I had the idea then to go to his house to see what he lived like, to see if I could find any information about the accident maybe, find the truth about what happened, and I'd been so popular, everyone would want to be my friend. My 14 year old brain thought it would be cool to be the one to break the mystery of our teacher, but looking back as an adult I can't help but feel such sadness at the invasion of privacy I had bestowed on a kind, gentle teacher. His door was unlocked, of course it was, I slid inside silent and smooth, carefully closing the door behind me, and set to work straight away. The house was nondescript, the same style furniture I'd seen in all the other homes including my own. A cat litter tray sat in the corner of the lounge, but there was no sign of the cat. I wondered if it may be hiding from me, perhaps curled up under the couch, and the more I thought it, the more I felt the sense as though I was really being watched. I'd never felt uneasy in a house before, not even when I was close to getting caught. It was, in a strange way, an excitement, a thrill, at nearly getting caught and the feeling I felt that night. It was different. It was my senses, urging me to get the hell out of there. But my fourteen-year-old self didn't listen, and instead, I forged on, finding myself in a cupboard under the staircase when I heard a voice above me. I held in a shocked gasp, racking my brain thinking if I had been quiet enough, waiting for the partially closed door behind me to be pulled open, and me exposed. But it didn't happen. The voice was muffled at first, and bizarrely it sounded as if whoever it was was humming show tunes. The voice rose, getting louder, and I tried hard to make out what they were saying. I wish I hadn't. The man was talking to a softly sobbing child telling them they must stop crying at once. Everything was okay. He began to hum the show tunes again, this time louder and more aggressively. It didn't seem to help, as the child began to wail louder, sobs turning into terrified screams that, after a loud bang, suddenly ceased. It sounded as if something, someone, had been thrown against the wall. I heard a soft thud a few moments after the bang, as if whatever it was had slid down the wall and onto the hardwood floor below. The silence didn't stay for long. The man began muttering something to himself that I couldn't quite make out. Something that sounded like made me and shush. He repeated it over and over until his show tunes humming began again. And until that too was drowned out by the sound of water running. It seemed to run for a long time. 
the pipes in the walls next to me groaning, sounding like ghosts moaning. I felt scared. More than scared. I thought about making my escape, but I couldn't hear where the man was, and that didn't feel safe to try and leave when he could literally be waiting outside the door. The door was open a crack, and with a racing heart, I leant down to try and take a peek, and that's when I saw the flash of pink fabric, the pink princess dressing gown of someone small and who should have been safe in bed. I wanted to reach out, to grab her, stop her from investigating the strange noises that must have woken her up from a peaceful slumber, but I stood, fearful and motionless. I didn't try and grab her, I didn't stop her. When I heard her blood-curdling scream just seconds later, I tasted salt on my lips and realized I was crying. Janny, why are you on the floor? Why is your head red? Wake up, Janny. Are you just tricking me like on Halloween? I'm going to get mum if you don't get up. The footsteps above me were slow, deliberate, and soon I heard the girl in the pink princess dressing gown choking and spluttering and saying no, no, no. Again it was silent. Again I heard the thump of something. Someone being dropped or falling on the hardwood floor above me. The man began muttering again. And then I heard the footsteps taper off. The sound of my own thumping heart, the only thing I could hear. I took my chance. I didn't try to peek out of the door, I just pushed it open. It didn't squeak, but the anticipation of it doing so did as much damage to my stress levels as if it had of. Silence. The hallway was empty. The front door was in view. A few steps. A few big steps and I was out the front door. I was gone. But then I heard the groan. It wasn't coming from upstairs but next to me. I stifled a scream, my body screaming not to look down. Do not look down. But I did. I looked. A woman lay just ahead. Blood pooling around her. Streaks of blood on the floor and thick lines. Where she had dragged herself toward the front door from wherever she had been hurt. Her face was half gone. The bone and teeth exposed on her lower jaw. One eye was swollen closed. Her nose dried with black blood. Her legs were missing from below the knees. I opened my mouth to speak, to ask if she was okay, or to scream. I have no fucking idea. I think I was in shock. For a kid who wasn't even allowed to play video games, I hadn't been exposed to a lot. That's what I've told myself all these years anyway. Tried to justify it to myself, for not helping for being scared. Anyway, when I opened my mouth, nothing came out. I shook my head at her, my mouth wide open yet wordless. I wanted to tell her I was going to get help, but I couldn't form the words. She blinked at me for a moment, the realization sinking in. She was as good as dead, and that's literally what happened. I saw the light go out of her eyes before it really went out. She lay and stared, not seeing. I haven't told people this full story, only bits and pieces, but everyone says the same. It wasn't my fault, I was just a kid, but they don't know the truth, I can't bring myself to tell anyone. The words get caught in my throat, so I have to write it down, get it out. I had just about reached the front door, when I heard the sound that sent shivers down my spine, a cold rock to the bottom of my stomach. I heard a baby wail, but I pretended I didn't. I pretended that it was just in my head, lying to myself to save myself. What a joke. I should have done something. I was at the end of the street when I saw the car of my science teacher drive back down the road toward the house I had just escaped. I wanted to warn him, but of course I didn't. I ran home and didn't look back. It was all over the paper in the days and weeks after. The first murder-suicide in our town. I heard my parents talking about it when they thought I was in bed. How Mr. Chester Moore went crazy and killed his entire family before barbarically killing himself. But it wasn't a murder-suicide. There was a lunatic on the loose who had killed a whole family and framed an innocent man. I tried my best to forget about it, to move on, not blame myself. I became a good kid, and I didn't go into anyone's empty homes anymore. I tried my best to make amends for what I hadn't done. That's why I'm a social worker these days. I moved on from that night when I was 14, or so I thought. Until recently when I had a new client. James. He was 12. His parents had been going through a messy divorce and James had taken it upon himself to find a new hobby. He had started breaking into homes 
in stealing. Recently, he had broken into a home and killed the couple who lived there. It wasn't my first sort of case like this. But it was the first time that one of the kids said something that truly terrified me. James told me it wasn't him. There was another man there, one who muttered to himself and hummed along to show tunes. I haven't slept right since talking with James. I swear if I listen hard enough as I lay awake in bed at night, I can make out that hum of show tunes coming from somewhere in my house. I've checked a dozen times. No one is ever there, but the sound remains. I don't know if I'm going crazy or not. Maybe getting my truths out about what happened that night might help me. I've tried to contact the police, but they tell me the case is closed. Long closed. That I need to let things go. I wish it was as simple as that. If there's any updates, I'll be sure to let you know. Until I saw what he kept in the basement, I might have been able to move past that insecurity. My name is Sonia. I'm 24 years old, and I started dating Mateo a year ago. We met while studying physics at university, and we had a connection. Whilst we were students, I thought something might come of that bond. But neither of us made a move. Our paths diverged after graduating. Mateo decided to study medicine, and I became a teacher. I almost forgot about the boy until our paths crossed last year. He'd given up on medicine, like so many other things he started. Back then, of course, I didn't see his flaws. I saw his outer beauty, and that blinded me to everything else. He was a bonny boy, as my Scottish mother would say. He had the sort of face that could make a person forget their better senses, and that almost happened to me. I don't trust pretty exteriors anymore. Before I tell my tale, I want you to know that I'm smart. I'm relieved to get that out of the way. I only mentioned it for the sake of context. In fact, that was the first time I ever admitted it. Self-confident affirmations are reserved for boys, after all. Ladies must be modest, and they must never embarrass their male counterparts. I'm being facetious, of course. I don't really believe that women should douse their flaming bras pick them up, and strap into the 1950s. Yet so many people in today's world do believe that. And it's not just the outspoken, oafish sexists who oppress women. It's the nice boys, too. The ones who tell you how amazing you look, though they wish you wouldn't lie by using makeup. The ones who tell you that you're strong for a woman. The ones who like you as long as you don't outshine them. Mateo took me out for dinner on our half anniversary. An act of romance. And now I see it for just that. An act. Much like everything he said and did. It was performative kindness. Kindness that would swiftly crumple like a house of cards. Oh, something funny happened at the lab today. Mateo chuckled. Yeah, I replied smiling. Smithy told me something that... Oh wait, do you remember him? Mateo asked. Yeah, wow, I didn't realize he worked with you, I said. He just started, Mateo replied. Anyway, we were reminiscing on our uni days. I told him that I'm dating you. He was impressed that I bagged you. Bagged me? I said, rolling my eyes at the wording. Lovely. Am I a bunch of apples on sale? Mateo smiled. Yeah. Well, you remember how goofy Smitty could be. Anyway, he was talking about you being a physics prodigy. Prodigy. That was the word he used. My boyfriend continued laughing and I raised an eyebrow. What's funny about that? Mateo smirked, seemingly befuddled by my frown. Well, I... No, it's just... Obviously, you're skilled in the subject of physics, but we're all skilled. I smiled, calming down. Oh, right. Yeah, silly smithy. We all received the same degree. I don't know why he was teasing you. Exactly. Plus, smithy and I were the ones who actually... Mateo trailed off. Well, anyway, shall we ask for the bill so we... You were the ones who... I interrupted, pressing my boyfriend to continue. The man shuffled irritably in his seat. Nothing. I'm going to ask for the bill. No, finish your sentence, I urged. Mateo sighed. It's nothing, Sonia. Stop making a scene. I'm not making a scene, I insisted. I just don't know why you're being so weird this evening. I just don't know why he had to belittle me. I'm a lab technician and you teach high school science. 
he said, shrugging. My eyes widened. Wow, wow. Yeah, I knew you'd react badly. That's why I didn't want to say it, Mateo said. That's why you shouldn't have said it, I replied. But it's disgusting that you were even thinking it. I'm sorry for thinking the truth, he shrugged, snapping his fingers at a passing waiter. May we have the bill, sir? The waiter nodded, sensing the tension in the air and hurriedly scurrying away. He could see the breadth of emotions on my face. The hurt, the anger, the confusion, above all else. After six months of dating, Mateo flipped a switch. He became an entirely different person. He'd never spoken to me like that before. He'd never shown his true colors. And at that point in the evening, he still hadn't shown them. The truth? I gasped. Are you serious? He shrugged for the third time, and each dismissive reaction only deepened my rage. But for the sake of not being branded the hot-headed bitch, I caged my tongue. The waiter unwillingly returned with a frightened look on his face, and he silently passed the card machine to Mateo. My boyfriend and I held our argument whilst he footed the bill. I offered to pay, but I was met with silence. Silence that, as soon as the payment was made, scared the waiter away. You just weren't cut out for the laboratory, and that's fine, Sonia. Like you said, we all have the same degree. It doesn't matter who's done more with it, Mateo said. Done more with it? I laughed. I could have worked in a lab. I just didn't want to work in a lab. Okay, Mateo replied, attempting to take the higher ground by remaining calm. Don't be hysterical. My fists clenched, as did my teeth. Well, stop saying hysterical things, Mateo. This wasn't about you, Sonia. Smithy was winding me up. He implied that you were too good for me, Mateo said, and he kept raving about how much of a prodigy you were. I received a first-class degree, you know. So did I, I replied, seething. Not only that, I was awarded top-performing graduating student. That's why Smithy was making the joke. If you'd actually bothered to turn up to the graduation ceremony, you would have known that. Mateo's face whitened. You, what? That's not a real award. I scowled. I could show you the certificate. I could even show you the scores from my tests, though that seems a little excessive. The man was stunned, but that wounded reaction morphed into fury. So what? Do you think grades mean anything? I don't care about a score that you received three years ago, Sonya. It's just a number. He growled, eyes swelling with tears that seemed sorrowful and ferocious in equal measure. A second ago, you really seemed to care about grades, I said. Mateo attempted to control his breathing, and his demeanor shifted. It shifted unnervingly quickly, in fact. I'm really sorry. That was completely out of line, he said. It was horrible, I spat. I want to go home. I'm so sorry, he persisted. It was about me. My ego was bruised by Smithy, and I took it out on you. Please forgive me. I sighed. I just want to go to bed. We'll talk about it in the... Sonia! A familiar voice bellowed. I twisted around to face Keith Dawson, my chemistry teacher from sixth form. His scraggly hair was grayer than I remembered, and he was standing beside a tall woman. Keith! I replied, grateful to see anything other than my boyfriend's vile face. This is my wife, Martina, he said. Hello, it's lovely to meet you, she said. It's lovely to meet you, too. And this is my... Boyfriend, Mateo, I said, feigning pleasantry. Hello, Mateo. Keith smiled, shaking my boyfriend's soft, timid hand. Did you know you were dating the highest performing student in her class? Mateo's eyes widened. You were the smartest at college and university, Sonia? We were actually just talking about that, I icily said. What a strange coincidence. Keith laughed. Really? The world does work in mysterious ways. Would you like to sit with us? I asked my old teacher before looking at my boyfriend. If that would be okay, Mateo? My boyfriend stifled a sigh, desperately trying to claw his way out of a deep hole. Yes, he said, that would be fine. Oh, we wouldn't want to intrude, Martina said, shaking her head. It's not an intrusion, Mateo lied. We finished eating. We were going to grab some coffees. We didn't get a coffee after our meal, sweetheart, Keith said. 
Well, that settles it, my boyfriend announced, smiling weakly. Join us. Thank you, Mateo. What a wonderful young man, Keith said. I thought about how well my boyfriend had cast the very same spell upon me. The elderly man and his wife squeezed into our cozy booth. It was around half eight in the evening and the tables were slowly starting to empty, but time flew by. We drank coffee and conversed. I was still deeply stung by Mateo's words, but I loved him. I loved who he'd been until that evening. I wanted to believe that something else had caused him to snap. He didn't mean to say those things to me, I told myself. Something must be wrong at work. Smitty upset him. Yes, that's it. I must say this makes me feel young. Keith laughed. My daughter's the same age as you, Sonya, and she'd probably be cringing at the silly things I'm saying. Don't worry, I'm cringing on her behalf, Martina laughed. Well, no change there, the man said, lovingly grinning at his wife. I've been thinking a lot about that exchange, the look they shared. I don't think Mateo ever looked at me in that way. I know good men are out there, men who actually see the person beneath the shell. But that's all I had ever been to Mateo, a shell. And when that soft, simple exterior cracked to reveal the substance within, he didn't like what he saw. So Sonia, what are you doing these days? Keith asked. I'm actually working as a high school physics teacher, I said, smiling. Physics? Keith gasped. But I, I know, it's okay. You still chose to teach science, Sonia. You chose the wrong type of science, but I won't fault you for that. Well, I still teach chemistry, I said. You know we have to teach all of the sciences. I know, I'm only teasing, Keith laughed. And what about you, Mateo? What do you do? I work as a lab technician, he bleakly replied. You don't sound too happy about that, Martina said, smiling. My boyfriend shrugged. I just think I could have done more with my life. I studied medicine for a little while, but, well, this suits me. You're so young, Mateo. You and Sonia can do whatever you want with your lives, Martina said. Mateo's face lit up. Sorry, it's just been a long week, but it's Saturday night. I think we deserve to enjoy ourselves. Don't you agree, Sonia? I nodded uncertainly. Say, how would you two fancy accompanying us for a nightcap? Mateo asked Keith and Sonia. I live across the road. It's a 30-second walk. Keith looked at Martina and she shrugged. He then cast his gaze to me. Would that be okay, Sonia? The kind man asked. I already sensed that you were just being polite by entertaining your old teacher and his wife this evening. I smiled. Keith, I'd be offended if you were to say no. I longed to sleep off that awful night. But I didn't want Keith or Martina to feel bad. And truthfully... I believed the earlier discomfort of the evening had dissipated. As we relaxed in Mateo's flat, the memory of the argument started to flee my mind. Alcohol might have helped, of course. The four of us drank whiskey in the living room. We laughed and we cried. We discussed everything from the wonders of science to our favorite Love Island contestants. Right, it's, um, it's eleven o'clock. Keith drunkenly slurred. And we're not as young as you crazy kids. We'd better head home. Where is... Where's Martina? She went to the toilet, I said. She'll be back. Yeah, I... That was about an hour ago, Keith pointed out, clearly struggling to think clearly. I'll go and check on her. Though I was also quite tipsy, I laughed as the inebriated man hobbled out of the room. Finding the moment too funny to forget, I immediately texted Tess my oldest friend. I let her know that our high school teacher was stumbling around Mateo's house drunkenly. She didn't believe me, so I followed Keith into the hallway and snapped a piece of photographic evidence. Flesh in the Great Tower! A distant voice screamed. The unexpected disjointed exclamation sent a shockwave of fear through my body. My phone jolted out of my hand and clattered to the floor. However, in my merry stupor, I didn't think to pick it up. I simply waddled forwards, chasing the source of the sound. In the grape, in the grape tower, a muffled voice loudly giggled. There was something deeply disturbing about it. The inflections of the words felt wrong, as did the varying volume. It sounded so unnatural and confused. 
I realized that the noise was coming from the basement, and I was baffled to find light spilling through the doorway. The door was always locked. Mateo claimed it had been locked since he started renting the place, and he also claimed that he hadn't bothered to ask the landlord for a key. H hello I tipsily called. Are you oh The basement light clicked off. Possessed by an instinctive urge to run, I found myself staring into the colorless crater of Mateo's basement. From the darkness below, footsteps pattered across the floor. They ricocheted off the walls, coating my back with goosebumps. I felt fear in my heart, but my head was telling me that I had to go downstairs. Resisting every primitive urge, I descended into the basement. With every squeak of my unsteady feet against the wooden steps, my fear heightened. I'm not a superstitious person. I'm not even particularly afraid of the dark. Nevertheless, months later, that basement still plagues my dreams. Hello? I called a second time. Nothing. I finally reached the bottom of the stairs, and I realized that I didn't have my phone. I was standing in the darkness, feeling a nearby wall for a light switch. Give and give, think! That disjointed voice wailed. That was when I saw her. The woman in the corner. A haunting, shadowy specter swayed listlessly at the end of the basement. Her form was dimly outlined by the streetlight pouring through Mateo's basement window. She was facing the wall and murmuring something. Are you okay, Martina? I asked. The woman stopped swaying so suddenly that my heart halted. She began to twitch violently, horrifying me. I felt as if I were being enveloped by the black walls of that underground dungeon. But I'd come that far. I had to help her. Guided by the streetlight, I stumbled towards the woman. Tripping over various boxes and bags, I slowly neared her, and I started to distinguish bodily features. For starters, it wasn't Marina. The woman was far too short. When I was close enough, I delicately placed a hand on the stranger's shoulder. The twitching slowed, as did her breathing. And then, at a glacial pace, her neck turned. Like a clockwork doll, her joints clicked and ached, as if she were being wound up for the first time in an age. Are you okay, miss? I quietly asked. The light caught her face and I hurled. The woman's forehead was caving inwards, as if it were a deflated football. Skin sealed the horrific slope, but the fresh flesh appeared to have been haphazardly stitched into place. Her eyes were glazed, as if she were no longer able to register the world around her, and drool dripped from her ever-parted, ever-trembling lips. I could. Yes, it has to be a thing. She jabbered nonsensically. Without warning, her hand gripped my upper arm in a vice-like hold. Never mind. Towers. Okay, Mom, she said, unleashing a hoarse cry. Uh, I'm going to get help. I shivered, prizing her strong fingers from my arm. Before the damaged woman could injure me again, whether intentionally or not, I twisted to flee the basement, and a warm wave of panic immediately drenched my face. There was a black silhouette at the foot of the stairs. Sleep well, Sonia, Mateo whispered. The black shape disappeared into the darkness, blind to his whereabouts. I fearfully tried to raise my hands in defense, but darkness followed a blunt, excruciating blow to the head. When I woke, my eyesight was blurry. My head felt as if it were split down the center. As I wrestled my eyelids farther apart, however, my mind started to wake. I realized I was eyeing a blindingly white surgical light above me, and when I looked away, my vision began to adjust. I was lying on an operating table in the middle of a gray, soundproofed box room, possibly only eight by eight feet. There were red stains on the walls. Some were fresher than others. As the ringing in my pulsating ears started to lessen, I became aware of moans. So, I lifted my head, which was a dreadful idea for two reasons. It was immensely painful, and it revealed a nightmarish sight. Sitting in a neat row against the wall, there were three women. Each of them had foreheads caved inwards, though some deformities were less prominent than others. Their eyes were lazily surveying the room, and their mouths gaped. 
but what broke me was the girl rocking on her legs. I recognized her. Chloe? I breathlessly whimpered. The girl's eyes didn't meet mine. She was staring at the wall with the same vacant expression as the other women. Make the okay, make it better, she said. Her voice was full of jarring inflections and volume shifts, and I started to sob, remembering the girl I'd known at university. A girl who had been so bright, so full of life. What happened to you? I cried, following a series of sudden thunderous footsteps. The door opened, and peering through it, I saw a familiar narrow window at the end of a lightless room. Mateo's basement lay beyond the gray, padded, blood-stained box. The man had hidden a prison of horror beneath his flat. How many nights did I spend above those poor, mutilated women? Ah, you're awake, he said. The malicious man was carrying a squirming body over his shoulder, and he placed her beside the other three women. It was the lady I'd first seen in the basement. Mateo, I croaked, wriggling in my restraints. Please... I was just preparing some dinner for you ladies, Mateo said, ignoring me. The man shuffled around the cramped room and handed each of the women a separate place. Chloe looked down at it, but the other two continued to stare aimlessly around the room, seemingly oblivious to the meals. It's a roast dinner, okay? Food. Do you understand? You've seen food before, silly girls. He chuckled, whilst helping each of them to eat. Your favorite meal, Michelle. And Rosie, you love your vegetables. Come on. What's wrong? Is it the meat? Is it a little tougher than usual? Mateo, I sobbed. Well, I've got a secret, the man whispered, continuing to dismiss me. It's a different cut of meat. A slightly older meat. Mateo paused, and he finally locked his eyes onto mine. They were wide and unhinged, much like the unsavory smile beneath. And, as I carefully inspected the food, I started to piece together the terrible turn of events. The bloody plates. The toughness of the meat. Where's Martina? Where's Keith? I whispered, lip quivering. The man smiled coldly. There wasn't room for them, Sonia, but there's room for you. Mateo began to unload the contents of a tool bag revealing an assortment of surgical instruments, and I started to scream tearfully. Why are you crying? He asked. I just implied that I would never let them eat you, Sonia. There. I stated it plainly for you. Honestly, I thought you were smart. Okay, Mateo. Okay, I'll be dumb. Is that what you want? I wailed. I'm just putting things right, Sonia. You remember what Chloe was like. I made her better. I love her, Sonia, Mateo said. And I'll love you, too. I promise. The man crouched down, and he grabbed Chloe's limp, lobotomized head in his hands. He placed a kiss on her caved forehead. She barely seemed aware of his presence. Potatoes, she whispered before groaning painfully. Mateo laughed sinisterly. Yes, clever girl. Well done. They are potatoes. You're starting to understand. I'm sorry for upsetting you, I sobbed. Just let me go, Mateo. You don't have to do this. It's only a small procedure, Sonya. You won't feel a thing. Well, you won't remember feeling a thing. You won't do much, actually. Life will be so much easier for you. We'll sit a physics test afterwards. I'm so excited to see who scores higher. He whispered. No, I moaned, watching Mateo remove the drill from the bag. Don't worry. I've vastly improved the procedure since I worked on Laurel. You met her earlier. She was my first trial. But look at Chloe. You can hardly tell she's any different, Mateo said. I cried in disbelief. She's not Chloe anymore. She's not even... Intelligent, Mateo finished, smiling. I freed her of that burden. And I'll free you too. As the drill started to whir, I screamed in terror. My mind braced for the horror of surviving as an unthinking shell... The inhuman man inched closer, and a wailing noise sounded in the distance. Frowning at the sudden distraction, Mateo begrudgingly turned the drill off. We could hear clearly. It was a police siren. No, what have you done? He snarled, baring menacing teeth at me. The man looked stuck. 
unable to formulate a plan. As the siren neared at a rapid pace, however, Mateo finally decided to flee. The police officers missed him by a minute, and one of the responders vomited at what they found in the basement, sending Tess the photo had saved my life. In my intoxicated state, I hadn't properly inspected the picture of Keith's drunken walk, but Tess noticed Martina's bloody body atop the kitchen table. The photo also revealed Mateo watching me from the shadowed corner of the kitchen. Whilst I searched the basement, my murderous boyfriend apprehended Keith in the bathroom. Then he attacked me. He clearly hadn't realized I sent the picture to someone. He must have believed he could clean up everything. But Tess immediately rang the police and Mateo abandoned the scene without a trace. The four lobotomized women are currently living under supervised care. I visit Chloe frequently, but it's incredibly painful to do so. Such a small fragment of her remains. A damaged, incomprehensible fragment. None of her sentences make sense. I don't even know whether she exists painfully or happily. What terrifies me above all other things is the knowledge that Mateo is still out there. First off, let me tell you a bit about myself. I'm a 22-year-old female who enjoys playing obscure and forgotten MMO games. I love being online, chatting with random people I encounter, but I never realized that I might encounter something like this. Due to recent events, I'll refer to myself as Ellen throughout the story because I don't want to make it worse. I also had to edit out the email addresses because the people who started sending to them started to DM me telling me that they responded very weird stuff back. It started on a site where people are able to discuss and talk about a game called Meridian 59. I was in one of the chats when a person called Yao Fulio joined in on a conversation. It started nice and friendly. He stated that we had played together in Project Gorgon once, and that he was pleasantly surprised to see me in the chat. Even though I couldn't recall his name, Maybe because I played with so many people, I enjoyed the conversation we had, and after a while, I gave him my Discord tag. We parted ways after that, and he said to add me soon so we could play together in the future. The next morning I saw a friend request in my Discord and saw that his Discord name was the same as the one in the chat yesterday. I added him, and after waving, he immediately came online. Hey, his first message read. I responded with a hello back and we started chatting again. After 15 minutes of polite conversation, I curiously asked him where his name came from. He didn't respond for a minute, but eventually, he told me that it was an anagram for something fun. He added the quotes himself. A bit weirded out, I didn't question him further and told him I was going to go and do something else, not specifying what that was or informing him further. He wasn't really happy about it, but reluctantly said, fine. I started to find his behavior a bit weird but shrugged my shoulders and started to boot up a new MMO I discovered some time ago. After three hours of playing it happened. I became a bit nervous, and my hair on my neck started to rise. As I was reading the in-game chat, a player called Yao Fulio joined the game. With such an obscure tag, I knew it could only be him again. I tried to calm myself down. It could be that this was just a coincidence and it was just a meaningless thing. But soon enough, he typed Hey Ellen in the chat, and I just knew I was dealing with a stalker. Not responding to him, I blocked him on Discord and Steam and also made my socials private so if he went snooping around he couldn't find me. I had heard enough creepy stories to know what stalkers are like. A bit relieved I was safe again, I let out a sigh of relief. I was glad it was a minimal encounter and I dealt with it before it went out of hand, or so I thought. Not even five minutes after blocking him, I got an email from a person called Redacted. It contained only five words, but it was enough to make me really, really scared. You made a big mistake. My blood went cold as I read it. I had no idea how he could have gotten my email as I use fake mail for most of my accounts. I didn't know how to deal with it or what to do anymore. None of the stories I had heard prepared me for this, and I felt a creeping fear that this guy was going to do something very bad. I emailed him back, saying that I blocked him for a reason, and that he was seriously creeping me out, 
stating I would go to the police if he continued like this. I then proceeded to create a new main email account and deleting the old one. It was going to take me some time to change my email everywhere, but I wanted to get rid of this guy as quickly as I could. For a few days nothing new happened. It seemed that he had lost his trail on me, and I prayed that he also wouldn't bother anyone else. After college I went home and booted up my computer to be welcomed by a new mail. A mail to my new main mail account. I was nauseous immediately and felt sick to my stomach as my hands began to tremble. Redacted had sent me a mail. It read like this. In shadows I dwell, an eternal dance with your fears. No escape, no sanctuary. My obsession, a relentless specter haunting your every step. I love you so much, my ever love, my dove that only wants me dying. You'll regret it though, you making me crying. I love you, I follow you. I now in full panic mode went to the nearest police station, showing them all the evidence asking them for help. They stated there wasn't much I could do besides putting down a complaint against an unknown. They told me to change my accounts again and to make sure I remained as safe as I could. When I got home again I started crying. I never asked for this, and I was so so scared someone was going to hurt me. Still in tears, I decided to call my dad who was on a business trip at that time. I wanted to hear his voice and wanted him to make me feel safe again. He didn't pick up at first, but after the third call, he eventually picked up, and I started blurting out everything. After not hearing him saying anything back or making any noise, I went quiet. The other part of the line was quiet too, only for a faint heavy breathing on the other side. I started crying again and whispered, Dad, but my question was answered by the other side of the line ending the call. I stood there for a couple of minutes, staring at the phone, not knowing what to do. I wanted to head back to the police again and have them check whether my dad was safe, but I was unable to move. I was so afraid and shocked, and that made me just stand there like a statue glued to the ground. I only could move again when the power of my house went out. My heart dropped, and frantically I started swiping on my phone to put on my flashlight. Had he found me? Did he cut off the electricity and was he going to kill me? Never in my life had I been so scared. I quietly went up the stairs, heading to my room, listening to any sound that could indicate he was entering my house. Reaching my room, I started to think that maybe something else had happened, trying to rationalize the power cutting out. Maybe it was just a malfunction and the whole street was out. How could a crazy stalker have found out a way to cut off my power, let alone finding my house when I never told my location to anyone online? It was as I entered my room I heard the sound of shattering glass downstairs. I now was fearing for my life and even peed myself a little. I quickly opened my closet and removed the grate that was at the bottom of the wall in the back. It used to be the entrance to the crawl space that led to the attic, but because of renovations it was now a small space, cut off from the entirety of the house. I was putting the grate back in when I heard footsteps running around my house. Doors were being opened with force and things were breaking and thrown everywhere. It went quiet for a second when all of a sudden the footsteps rushed upstairs and the door to my room was thrown open. Through the grate I saw a small beam of light shining through the door of my closet. The beam became brighter and the footsteps louder as it came closer to the door. The ladder was slammed open and the light ran through the closet. Only a bit of clothing was hiding the grate leading to me now. My heart was racing and cold sweat was running down my spine. I slowly placed my hand in front of my mouth to mask my breathing. Tears were running down my face, but I managed to stay completely silent. He went deeper into the closet, shining his flashlight everywhere. I could hear his heavy breathing and smell the stench that came off him. I could only see a little bit of him through the mix of grate and clothing, but I did manage to see something. He was large, very large, wearing stained clothing with some stains looking like blood. In his left hand, he held a flashlight and in his trembling right hand was a big, dull-looking kitchen knife. He was now standing practically beside the grate. Only the clothes on the clothes hanger were masking the top half of it. I was counting down the seconds before he found me, when he made a blood-curling scream and ran out of my closet, closing the doors behind him. He started frantically running around my house, screaming my name and, I love you, let me take care of you, my dove. It took four hours for him to calm down and give up. I heard him opening my front door and leaving. I started crying heavily from the trauma I just had lived through. It took some time for me to calm down a little and call the police. 
comforting me. The responder told me a unit was on the way and told me to remain where I was. He stayed on the line till I could hear the sirens, and then told me to remain strong before finishing the call. Hearing the sirens coming closer, I started opening the grate and started to climb out of my safe space. I couldn't believe that I was still alive and was thanking God when my closet doors were thrown open and a man rushed at me. He grabbed me by the throat and slammed me against the wall. I could feel my blood being cut off to my head because of the grip, and in the darkness, I could see his big dark eyes looking at me, flashing his yellow rotten teeth in a wicked smile. I've caught my dove, was what I heard when a knife was thrust into my stomach. My vision got blurry and I started drifting away, losing consciousness. I'll always be with you was the last thing I heard before I passed out. I saw a big light when I opened my eyes. I thought I was in heaven, but when I opened them fully, I realized it was a hospital. I was hooked up to various life supports, and a bag with an unknown fluid went into my vein. A nurse came into my room and surprisingly said, You're awake. Soon after, a doctor and a police officer came into the room. The doctor told me I had been out for three days and was recovering from a stab wound to my stomach and the infection that followed it. He then nodded at the officer, and the officer started speaking. He stated that after I lost consciousness, the police arrived at my house and found me laying on the ground, bathing in my own blood. They called the ambulance, and because of a wonder, as he said, I survived. He told me that the person who had entered my home didn't leave any DNA behind, and even my throat was wiped clean by him to make sure nothing was left behind. The only thing they found was a note stating the ninth dove for my pen. I'm still in the hospital recovering. I don't know what to do next, but I wanted to write this to make everyone aware of this. Don't trust the people you meet online. He might be one of them.